Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Hillary. I'm the communications director here at Copper Hills. Uh, you know, Brad was actually supposed to speak tonight, but he's still recovering. <laughs> so uh, thoughts and prayers with our entire, past entire uh, pastoral staff. They need them. You know, it's been a long week for them. So uh, no, in actuality, of course, it's Mother's Day weekend. And each year we try to do something a little bit different. So uh, obviously I have some friends with me today and we are going to be hearing from them in just a little bit, and I'll give some introductions, but I do want to let you know what we're doing today. Uh, if you have been joining us for the last few weeks, you know that we are in the middle of a series called The Way, and we've been looking at the first followers of Jesus, often referred to as followers of the way, and how they were able to influence and infiltrate and impact their culture and their society for Jesus, and then what that looks like for us today. So with it being Mother's Day weekend, we thought that we would hear from some fabulous women, uh, wives, many of them are mothers, and uh, we have just a treat for you tonight, and we are really looking forward to it. So some brief introductions. These ladies may look familiar to you. They are the lucky, lucky wives of all of those gentlemen in the video. So uh, immediately to my left, we have Elfie Clausen. She is Brad's wife, our lead pastor. Then we have have Tisha Kubala. She's married to Kevin, who's our family life pastor. Mary Frances Wilson, you are married to Russell, our student pastor. Paula Wilson, married to Paul, our spiritual formations pastor. And then last but not least, Heidi Nelson, you are married to Butch, who you heard from just a moment ago. He is our worship pastor. So ladies, thank you so much all for joining us today. So we are going to just jump right in. Um, again, we're talking about what it looks like for us as women to impact our society and our culture and our world today for Christ. And it's really impossible to do that without having a personal relationship with him. So we were just curious about some of your own personal spiritual practices, how you really uh, foster that relationship and friendship with Jesus. So we were hoping you might be able to share a little bit about what that looks like for you guys today. So I'll start. We planned this with me starting. Um, I am for, I, my kids are grown and gone, but for a long time I've been a journaler. I like to write down my thoughts so I can remember them. Um, and for years and years, I journaled about what I wanted to change about myself. And year after year at New Year's, I would look over my journal and I tried to decide what I was gonna fix the next year. And after about five years or so, I realized that my first journal and my last journal matched. And um, they, I was not any thinner, I was not any happier, I was not any stronger when Jesus, it was just nothing good. So I threw those journals away and I started to, somebody had told me about the SOAP method of journaling. So what that was is reading your Bible, picking a, a verse that you were wanting to um, think about a little bit more. So I would write that verse down and then O stood for observation, which is basically context. And so I would write down what was happening in that chapter or in that story. And then A was application. And so I would try to figure out how that verse helped me in my life and then I would pray about it and ask God to help me change that in my life. So that was great and it was a good way to learn lots about the Bible because I studied context and I studied application and that was good except I never, when I looked through my journals again just recently, I didn't know my context. I didn't know what was going on in my life when I was writing those applications. So um, I've now done a little bit different. I'm writing down memories of, of the day, what's going on in my life, along with how Jesus is wanting to change me. And that's what I'm doing. I actually journal as well. I love to journal. Um, I journal my prayers, but I just wanted to share that with me, I don't have kids out of the house. Every single one of my kids is in the house all day with me. <laughs> and I used to just scrap my morning time. Like if I got interrupted, I would just call it a day and not finish. Um, and then I would be cranky. I would be pr cranky at the kids and cranky for the rest of the day. And I remember one of my girls years ago, and I don't even remember which one said this, but she said, mom, I just love how every morning I come down and you're reading your Bible and you always smile at me and you always give me a hug. And I'll remember that forever. And 
I did not do that at all. <laughs> so I think she got it from like a TV show or something, but <laughs> it inspired me and I do that every single day now. And now I just, they know morning time is quiet time. So they just join me and sit down and the little ones need a lot of reminders like, shh, we're being quiet right now. Um, but I do it with the kids now as opposed to just getting rid of it altogether. You know, that's how with us, our grandkids aren't in our house, obviously. Um, when our oldest grandchild um, flew for the first time by himself unaccompanied from Minnesota, uh, he would wake up in the morning and I was already sitting there doing my Bible study and he goes, Grandma, where's my journal? And I had kept his little journal where he would scribble in, but now he was able to draw pictures and I w it was so rewarding. I love that with kids just uh -huh. being with you. Those are great. Um, I was not as good at that. <laughs> um, I think for me, being a mom just made me feel how inept, like the entire time you're like second guessing yourself and how in the heck are you supposed to do this? And you know, you get ideas from one person, but your kids are different. Each one is different. Your kids are different from other people's kids. They got different parents. There's so much that I felt like I needed <laughs> God all the time. But I think over the 25 years, it's been learning how to pray. Um, when they were little, the two things, since they were born, the two things I prayed for is that they would know and love Jesus with their heart and choose him for themselves, and that God would provide them with a spouse, that he would give them a, a great believing spouse. And he did awesome in the first one, yes. So, um, I, so see, answers prayers. But um, the thing I, prayed about as I got older is more about me. Like, God, I'm going to screw them up royally. Please don't let them remember me just blowing up there. Please don't let them remember me being horrible to them. And then as I got even older, it was more about all the things they were doing. But um, the thing that was hard that I would beat myself up about is that I'm not being consistent. You know, I'm just shooting up 911 prayers. God, help them do this. God, be with, help her find a friend. God, whatever. But I would just beat myself up because I wasn't consistent. The thing that really helps me with consistency is when I found out about Moms in Prayer. Every single mom should go home and Google Moms in Prayer. It's an international organization, and it provides moms with a structure of praying for your kids and their school. Every school is listed on the website, and if it's not, you sign it up, which I've actually done. And um, it gives you one hour, because we moms don't have a lot of time, but one hour of structured prayer. And please, please, please don't ever be intimidated in praying. Be inspired by what you hear people praying. And because the thing that got me is finding another woman to pray with. And 90% of the, all the years I've been praying, it's just been one other mom. And that's so fine. I used to be so discouraged by that. But it was actually so cool because you get there and you only have an hour. And you're not talking about what you're going to pray about. You just start praying. And the biggest thing that I got out of that over the last 25 years is I'll just start praying for my kid for what they need. And then whoever is sitting next to me and praying with me, she just joins in and just prays what the Holy Spirit puts on her heart to pray. And I cannot tell you how many times either what they prayed about was something that I'm like try crying over because it's exactly what my child went through that week and needed prayer for. Or later down the week, it would be something like, oh my gosh, she just prayed for that and this is what it was. So it's truly impacted me to see the Holy Spirit prayer. Um, a specific example of that is I'm praying with a mom now and um, she's a single mom and she's got three boys and they've been saving up what they can for their oldest who is a senior to get a car, needed a car. And we prayed for it. This is like our very second week this year. And then the, we pray on Friday mornings. Saturday night, Saturday morning, her son goes into uh, worship where he, at his church, so he helps lead worship and play in the worship band. And a gentleman at their church came over to the mom and said, you know what, it's just been really encouraging to see a young man being responsible and being committed and coming and serving each week. God just put this on my heart to give to you. Guys, it was the exact same amount. It doubled the amount that they had saved for a car. So they had saved 4000 This man just handed her $4,000. So she was just calling me crying. God just provided. We just didn't know how we would provide for a car. And so just infinite many times, infinite many, lots of times, God has happened. And 
it made the prayers just seem that it wasn't what we prayed for specifically, it was just how the Holy Spirit answered it. So prayer has just been huge. That's amazing. And those are just some great examples of how to deepen your friendship and your relationship with God. And then you can see that impacting the community. How else does, does your personal relationship with Jesus translate into uh, your lives, maybe outside the home, in your workplace or your community? How else have you seen that work? So my workplace, my career is in medicine, and I've been in private practice for about 24 years. Uh, my area of expertise is the lower extremity. So as I am seeing patients for their feet and ankles, there's a lot of talk. There's a lot of interaction, and uh, I learn a lot about them personally in addition to medically. And one of my practices um, personally is to speak with Jesus throughout the day. And so I find myself speaking with Jesus or praying over these patients. Um, oftentimes, they don't know that I'm doing this, but I would tell you there are times that I've been prompted to pray over them, um, and they do know it. Uh, so there's a particular family. We probably have a 20-year relationship, and uh, there has been some loss in that family recently. And well, a few years ago, they lost a child, and it was devastating. I, I saw the entire family, and so I lost a patient. And uh, of course, you don't ever expect to outlive your children. Or, excuse, yeah, yes, thank you. And uh, so that was devastating, and I was able to pray with them as a family, because uh, they often come in all as a group. and. Now one of the spouses just deceased uh, recently, and the remaining spouse is extremely stoic, but I know the pain. Uh, you can see it, and so I continue to work with that uh, remaining patient. Um, it is a work in progress, and I pray for them when I'm not with them. I pray for them when they come in, and uh, I just feel as though I can share the hope of Christ with them. You know, I also am in the medical field. I'm not a doctor. I work with hormone replacement therapy for the most part. And I have people that come in and tell me all sorts of things. But the thing I love, like we talk about journaling and how we increase our walk with Jesus. The Holy Spirit often prompts me with what I've written in my journal the morning before. Like recently, I was reading, um, a patient came in, and her husband was at Mayo getting his chemotherapy while she was having her appointment with me, and she was so distraught, she hadn't been able to sleep. And that morning, I had read Psalm 3, where David had run and he was fleeing from Absalom because his son was trying to kill him. And he said, I've got so many enemies, but I'm thinking it's like he's got so many bad things happening to him. Yet David said, but God, you are a shield around me. And then he lay down and slept and he woke up um, rested because God had been watching over him. And so I asked this lady, I said, do you have a faith? I don't know where your faith is. And she says, oh, I believe in God. And so I don't know what kind of belief and what that means. However, I said, you know, I just read this morning how God is your shield and how he, he will protect you when you lay down and sleep. So it, it's just a way to comfort people. And it's so, it's the Holy Spirit. Whereas for me, um, when we talk about going into community or workspace or, you know, how our relationship with Jesus impacts that, it feels really different um, because it feels like my whole world is here at the church. Um, I'm married to Russell, who um, is on staff. We are both, um, we love being involved with the youth. Um, we lead a life group. I also work here, so everything is here. Um, and so sometimes I can feel like I have a pretty limited sphere of influence. However, at the beginning when we first moved here, I really used the safety and familiarity of the Copper Hills bubble because um, I just it took a while for me to get my feet underneath me. Um, but last year, I really felt like the Lord convicted me to to be in something outside of Copper Hills. And 
I had a hard time like finding something or creating something. Um, so I asked the Lord to provide an opportunity to say yes. And we were with at dinner with some new friends and they randomly brought up this opportunity to coach um, volleyball at a club. And I didn't know anybody there. Uh, it was halfway across town, but I felt like this was the yes that I'd asked the Lord for. And so um, I've been doing that this whole year. It has not been easy necessarily, but it's given me an environment completely separate of Copper Hills. And it's given me an opportunity to be with a dozen 14 year old girls who are also completely separate of Copper Hills and often the church. Um, one cool story is we were going through faith in an anxious world series with the youth. And so we were engaging in conversations with that here at the church and that we get practice one of the girls had an anxiety attack and I got to sit with her in the bathroom for 30 minutes and have the exact same conversations, listen to her and talk with her that I was having here and I got to have it there. And so that was really cool just to see the Lord use that space, even though it, it wouldn't have been my first choice. Um, it ended up being really cool. A lot of us feel that same way. Even if we don't work at a church, we have a lot of relationships here and we feel like maybe our sphere of influence isn't as big and we kind of struggle with how do we truly impact our culture when so much of our world is here. And so I think that's great that even though we can't always see where God is placing us, that he has a plan and he's going to put you right where you need to be. Um, and even if you don't know what he's preparing you for, he's preparing you for something, right? And I know uh, kind of going back to our personal relationship with Jesus and, and how that can help us in whatever phase of life we're in. I know Mary Frances, you had um, something happen to you earlier this year that you wanted to share um, about how Jesus kind of walked with you through that time. For sure. So right about the time that I said yes to coaching, um, Marcel and I found out we were pregnant and I felt like this is another yes that the Lord has given me an opportunity um, because that's not something I would have wanted last year. And so we were really excited, started planning what that would look like for our family. And then um, in February, February, after a visit to the ER, found out it was ectopic um, and had to have emergency surgery. So that was really difficult because it went from something that was a, a private joy to a very unexpected and public wound. Um, so when we were talking about spiritual practices that help us get through difficult times, for for me, um, something that was really important that the Lord had put on my heart before this was having quiet time with just the Lord. And what I mean by that is with our roles here at the church, a lot of times we have a life group, whether it's a student or adult or a conversation with someone or even just working at the church, I would go to my quiet time and I would place this pressure on that time to have something worth saying, or I need the Lord to give me something. And then that would create this frustration. And like, if it didn't happen, it felt like a waste of time. And so I was journaling about that one day and I journaled this thought as if it was from the Lord. And it was, um, you know, I would, I would fill you regardless of whether or not you pour out. And I would love you just for the sake of you being loved because you're worth, worth being loved to me. And so obviously pouring out and loving is important fruit of following Jesus. But for me, I realized the importance of having that space just to be loved and to be filled. And I see now, um, that the Lord prepared me for that because um, following the surgery and the loss, I've just felt so empty in a new way, just physical, um, physically, emotionally, spiritually. And for the first couple of days, I really did not spend time with the Lord. I was just confused and disoriented. And But when I finally um, started journaling, I just realized this, this kind of emptiness is meant to only be filled by the Lord. Um, and my, my circumstances don't determine who God is. You know, I would love to be sitting up here on Mother's Day and be talking about how excited I am to be a mom in a couple months, and that's not the case. But God is still a God who who fills um, and who loves, even when it feels like it's empty and there's loss. And so I've just gotten to experience, and I know this now, that that God's perfect peace is more important than my perfect plan. And um, that's been really, really good. So, but I know like I'm young, I'm just on this journey of, of womanhood and motherhood. I know that, you know, this is just, the, you know, one story for me. And I know these women have so, so many stories um, up here to share and, and wisdom in that. And how old are you? I'm 23. Well, that's okay. I'm 60 and I'm forgetting the stories. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> so 
I mean, obviously, we, we all go through difficult times. Um, nobody's life is perfect, and we don't always understand what we're going through, uh, especially recently with this whole past year with COVID and a lot of uncertainty. And um, for those of us who are moms, there was, you know, kids kind of going in and out of school and dealing with distance learning and homeschooling. Um, I know, Heidi, that was something that really changed your situation over, over the last year. <laughs> Last year, online school, if any of you are a part of that, it was so fun for nobody. <laughs> and I, I mean, I, I really did enjoy having the kids home, um, but I literally would wake up like, oh, everyone's home. And within five minutes, I was crying. I was like having panic attacks. And I mean, oh, Jackson turned his report in through email and he was supposed to record his answer on this other app and you forgot the login and I'm like ah, I just can't do this and then husband working from home and I don't know if you did that whole like what what did you learn about your husband during quarantine <laughs> he talks on speakerphone 24 <laughs> 7 so <laughs> um which is great if you don't have like three kids on zoom calls and two little toddlers that you're just constantly going shh, 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 shh. Um, so yeah, that was fun, um, sarcastically, it was not fun at all, and I honestly, if you were a teacher during that, like, everyone should just donate any extra money to you, because I don't know how you got through that, um, but there was, yeah, that part aside, there was a time when I actually did email the teachers, um, one teacher in particular, and just said, you know, you need to expect a lot less from the Nelson family through the end of the year. This is just, I. this is what I need to survive. Um, I was nine months pregnant with baby number six. I had two little kids that were not yet in school and three that were in school. Um, and I was just so overwhelmed. So we had about a month left of school and I had already sent that email. So now we had like these rare mornings that were calm and quiet. And I just remember one morning, I was sitting in the same white chair that I literally like could have won a record for how many days in a row I could sit without moving until this baby was born. Because no one was coming over, so I don't need to clean the house or do anything like that. And we missed that little window. This is like early on. We missed the window of grocery shopping. So we were eating like top ramen and lunch meat for dinners and um, we had no real food. So there was nothing to cook. There was nothing to do. And, um, but I remember sitting there with my kids and I told them, I said, you know, something like this is probably never going to happen again in your lifetime. Like, what are the odds that this will ever happen again? This is a very rare situation. And, um, we had gotten some like dollar journals earlier in the year that I had. And so I said, you know, why don't you guys write down your stories, like share your feelings and write stuff down because one day you might have your own kids and they're going to ask you know, mom, do you remember? Yeah, do you remember that time? Like way back in the olden days, do you remember what that was like? And, um, but they're gonna wanna go back and remember because they really are kind of young, but at least if they write it down, maybe they'll remember and see some of the stuff that um, was important to them at the time. So while they were sitting there writing their stories, um, I just completely felt compelled to write one as well, especially for our daughter, Charlie, who struggled the most during this time. She was, this was like her first real year of school. She was in kindergarten. Um, this girl like does homework for fun and plays school all the time. She loves her friends, her teacher, she's outgoing. And so she was thriving in that atmosphere and then it just like shut down. And I could tell that she felt, um, kind of isolated because Addie and Jackson didn't get it. They were like, this is the most amazing thing ever. And they're like, Charlie, you only miss it because you're in kindergarten and you still get snacks and you get to, like 50 recesses. And um, so I think, and she would ask questions like, are all my friends playing together right now? Are they all at school? And we told her, but by those questions, I think there was something in her that she just felt like maybe this really is only me that's going through this. Um, and so I, I, this was only God's doing because I don't know how this happened, being fully pregnant and at the end of the school year, but I wrote a children's book and we like completed it and got it published. It actually came out the same day that I was birthing our son, um, which is God's amazing timing too. 
But that was kind of a turning point for our family, I think, um, because Charlie, you know, she's six at the time, and to know that, like, her story has meaning and value, and even though it's not huge, um, I think it's Rick Warren that says, like, our greatest uh, tests will become our biggest testimonies, and you kind of can practice that with your kids with the little things when they're young, and so she got to learn that, you know, this this is not fun. I get it. Just like a lot of other people are going through this. Um, but just because other people are going through harder things doesn't mean that it's not valid. And, you know, teaching her that your story does matter and God can use it and repurpose it for good um, was just a really, really cool experience. And so she got to see that go out and then see her friends you know, with their books, and they're like, that was like me too, and it just was a really cool experience to see the the hope in that, and there was something positive that came from this really crummy situation, um, which, you know, I jokingly say it was awful that time, but it was a blessing in disguise, and I look back on that year for us as a family, and we are so thankful for what we learned, because there's lessons hidden in everything, and um, it was just a really cool time for us to be able to sit down and do that together. That's incredible. And I think, I mean, you, you said the key word, you said hope, right? Um, there is hope in every situation, no matter what we're going through. And I love the title of your book because it's called You're Not Alone, right? And so I think a lot of us, um, whether it's as women, as wives, as moms, as people, <laughs> you know, there are times where we often feel alone. But the hope that Jesus gives us is to know that we are not alone, that he's always with us. Can I just jump in there? Always. <laughs> I do that a lot. Um, when quarantine just started and we were not meeting as a church for the first little while, Brad and I would watch the Saturday night service. And then after that, I mean, what else was there to do? We would watch a series called Alone. I think Butch got us to watch that. And it's where they drop 10 people into the wilderness about five miles apart. There's no way that they can get to each other because they don't know where the other person is and there's mountains or water in the way. And they give them 10 pieces of equipment that they're allowed to take with them. And they're just supposed to, the longest one that can last out in the wilderness wins. And at the time it was $500,000. But I was thinking Jesus also went into the desert to be alone with God. And those 40 days, and I think he would have won the first series of Alone. Um, but the 40 days, he didn't have any equipment. Um, he just spent time with God. And that time with God prepared him for um, the people that he would need to love, for the parables that he would tell. He didn't give in to de temptation. And he, it prepared him for those three years where he would ultimately die on the cross. And I'm thinking being alone with Jesus is the best kind of alone that you can be. So you learn so much, and he gives you the strength for whatever you need to have for that day. Amen. Well, ladies, thank you so much for being here. It's been incredible just to hear your stories and your examples of what Jesus has done in your life and through your life. Would you please join me in thanking everybody for being here today? <laughs> All right, would you please join me in prayer? Lord, thank you. Thank you so much for these incredible women Thank you for allowing them the opportunity to share their testimonies, to share how they deepen their relationship and their friendship with you, and then to share how you in turn can use their lives and their circumstances and their experiences for your glory. God, you're just amazing. Lord, would you please just help all of us in our walk with you? Help us learn how to better spend alone time with you, how to better, better develop and foster our relationship with you so that we can in turn impact our community, just like those first followers of the way, that we can influence and infiltrate and be more like you in our community, God. We love you, Lord, and we thank you so much. And it's in your name that we pray. Amen. Amen.